Now, lest you think you have inadvertently stumbled into yet another cable television cooking show, I want you to remember that Jesus himself brought it up. Salt. You know, salt is essential to human life. Did you know that the National Academies of Science recommends that each of us, on average, take in about 2,400 milligrams of sodium daily? That's about a teaspoonful. If you eat a whole lot less than that, your cellular electrolytes may become unbalanced, resulting in an increased risk of heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular disease. Yes, that's right. For most people, low sodium intake is dangerous. And if you consume a lot more than the average, well, you can also take on extra weight or become at risk for high blood pressure. Excess sodium can be toxic. So high sodium intake is also dangerous. But this salt that is essential to human life, having either too much or too little is fraught with risk to our health and our safety and even our survival. Hey, maybe this is about cooking after all. Too much salt and the dish is ruined. Too little salt and it's tasteless. Hmm. Jesus' metaphoric use of salt deserves a little bit of deconstructive analysis. It's a complex metaphor. You know, you've heard the old expression, he's the salt of the earth, right? That indicates someone's dependable, reliable, and trustworthy. Jesus uses that very expression in the Sermon on the Mount. You are the salt of the earth. Yet salting the earth is also a destructive thing. It was the scorched earth tactic of warfare before Agent Orange was invented. According to the book of Judges, Abimelech sowed his own capital of Shechem with salt after quelling a revolt. He killed all the people, raised all the buildings, and then salted all the fields, assuring that no one would forget who was boss. Salt, you see, is neither good nor evil in itself, but it can be used for good or for evil, to sustain life or to prevent it, to regulate the body's electrolytes or to induce a stroke. You know, you can take something with a grain of salt, thereby making it more palatable, or you can rub salt into a wound, increasing the pain. Add to this that in the Roman army of Jesus' day, salt was a regular part of a soldier's compensation. If a soldier was worth his salt, he had performed well, and he'd be paid accordingly. And before refrigeration and freeze-drying and chemical stabilizers and canned goods, well, salt was the best preservative known to humankind. Salt is so powerful a symbol that Mahatma Gandhi was able to use it to topple the British Empire and their colonial rule of India. Way back in 1930, the British levied a tax on salt as they had a monopoly on the salt trade. Gandhi decided to walk some 240 miles to the sea coast, a journey that lasted 20 three days, and the procession following him grew until it was 200 miles long. Upon reaching the ocean, Gandhi raised a lump of mud and salt and declared, with this I am shaking the foundations of the British Empire, and they yet then boiled it in seawater to make a commodity that no Indian could legally produce, salt. Historians consider this a turning point in the movement for the independence of India, something that was not finally achieved until 1947. You may remember that something remarkably similar happened with tea in Boston Harbor, a turning point in the movement for our American independence. The British in 1930, it seems, had very little appreciation for their own history and thus were destined to repeat it and they did not understand the importance of salt. Jesus, of course, never underestimates the power of figures of speech, or images, or metaphors, or allegories. And so this discourse on salt is just jam-packed with meaning and nuance and symbolic value. 
And although many paths present themselves, there's just one particular direction for us to go with this sodium-soaked sermon. I want to talk about religion in contemporary society. You know, we're all familiar with over-salted religious organizations and sects, you know, radical fundamentalists, extreme ideologues, that sort of thing. You can almost feel the severity of a high blood pressure in the veins of most television evangelists, can't you? This kind of religion clearly suffers from over-salting. For when their bodies try naturally to expel the excess, they rub the salt in other people's wounds as if to punish them for being wounded. This kind of religion is really dangerous. It's really popular, but it's really dangerous. And it's always focused on demeaning and degrading some others because they're not living up to some fictive standard of behavior. I call their standards fictive because they're always based on some human interpretation, not true divine inspiration. You know what I'm talking about. Women must obey their husbands. Men must not sleep with men. Men must not marry the daughter of a foreign god. These are all abominations in the sight of God. That's what our Holy Scripture tells us. And then these folks who insist that those must be obeyed, condemning those because Holy Writ says don't do them. Well, they go off and eat their shellfish, or they shed innocent blood, or they sow discord in a family, or they tell lies, or they dig into that delicious pork tenderloin, or any kind of meat that was killed more than three days ago. And you know what? All of those are abominations too. This is the danger of over-salting religion. While we see more and more of it around us, fortunately we Anglicans are more delicate in our seasoning. We're too careful in our crafting of language, too shy for emotional outbursts, too reticent in our outward expression, and don't get me wrong, I think these are all really good things. We rarely suffer from too much salt. But we often risk the other danger, too little salt in our religion. For this there is inspiration not from the Holy Spirit, at least not directly, but from J. Edwin Bacon, Jr., who is the rector of All Saints Church in Pasadena, California. In a sermon, Father Bacon expresses concern that preaching from pulpits in this country has become too neutral, less salty, if you will. And as a result, religion becomes more and more of a problem. He says, Jesus proclaimed that religion too frequently is not a part of the solution. Too often it is not only part of the problem, it is the problem. Like salt that has lost its flavor. The Revelation to St. John, quoting Father Bacon again, speaks of the church of Laodicea that had become so bland, so ineffectual, so callous to human suffering, so cowering before the saber-rattling of the empire of the day, so lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, that God said, I will spew you out of my mouth. That is exactly what happens to churches and other faith communities that do not stand up, speak up, and act up when human beings are not treated with the dignity and honor due those who bear the image of God. I feel in great solidarity knowing that Pope Francis is preaching this same message in Philadelphia this afternoon. It's easy to see the over-salted religious zealots and say, that's not us. But what of this diet of bland spirituality that has served at so many altars? Salt is essential to human life, but having too much or too little is fraught with risk to our health and our safety and even our survival. Finding the balance is a lifelong journey. It includes taking risks being willing to allow failure, making mistakes, and trying new things, and includes turning around, going back to what works, avoiding hazards, and steering clear of danger. It's a never-ending, constantly changing, and life-consuming crusade. And the only way that any of us has a glimmer of a chance of success 
is because God wills it so. Here, here among the faithful, we find the strength to persevere. Here among the faithful, we heed the warnings to avoid pitfalls we might otherwise suffer. And here among the faithful, we find the motivation to do justice, love, mercy, and walk humbly with our God. <clears throat> so here we are, my friends, a place where we will never put too much salt on our liturgy, a place where you need not check your conscience at the door, a place where our worship can serve to transform the people of God, empowering us to daring action on a part of the oppressed, 